gentlemen, we have an incredible show for you tonight. First up, our guest, chef owner of Beast Restaurant, Naomi Pomeroy. Let me hear it, ladies and gentlemen. We also have Ken's Artisan Empire founder, Ken Forkish. Ladies and gentlemen, get loud and ready for comedian Curtis Cook. We've also got some sketch comedy coming straight from the Aces. And our musical guest this evening is Ma Chris Hubbard and the bonus tr show trio. Give it up for him. You guys all look great. Uh, this is exciting. We're going to start with the news. That's how we're going to do it. Uh, I, I bet you can probably guess, but the most amazing story of the week in local news also made some national news. You know what it is? The cat. You guys are so good. Best story. A Portland family had to call 911 after they locked themselves in their bedroom because of their suddenly violent 22 pound house cat. <laughs> They were protecting their baby and their dog from the ferocious cat. Fortunately, the baby was unharmed, uh, but the dog had to be put down for cowardice. <laughs> Here's a tip, you guys. If your 22-pound cat is ferocious, you have to move out. It's the cat's house now. <laughs> and leave the child. The cat will raise the boy well. <laughs> Uh, a Gresham man was, who has been listed, who was listed, who was listed as missing for two weeks, was found driving around Seattle looking for an apartment. <laughs> Gresham police were like, "Oh my God! Now everybody is missing!" Oh, I just had my eyes closed. Policing is hard. <laughs> Actually, when they found out that the man was just trying to move to Seattle, the uh, Gresham coroner changed his status from presumed dead to dead to us. <laughs> a drunk couple attempted to burn down a pizzeria with homemade moonshine because they were denied service. <coughs> if you guys were guessing that happened in Eugene, 10 points for Gryffindor. <laughs> Absolutely where that happened. Uh... <laughs> Up north, the Vancouver man was sentenced to two years in prison for mailing threatening letters filled with white powder to senators, comedians, and media personalities. Dude, politicians and entertainers love white powder. You're terrible at threatening. <laughs> also, on a personal note, you guys, my, uh, my threatening letter didn't get here yet. And uh, I'm sure it was just a clerical error. I'm sure, <laughs> I'm sure my anthrax host will be here sooner or later. Um, it's fine. <laughs> now I can't get out of the crying face. Uh, oh, did you guys see this? This is a fun story. A Southwest Airlines flight that was headed from Seattle to LA had to make an emergency landing in Portland this week because the, a passenger was screaming for booze, throwing gang signs, preaching for Jesus, and complaining that his first class ticket wasn't being honored. <laughs> he was so rude and uncooperative, apparently, that the plane, they said, we have to land in Portland right now and give this guy a job with Southwest. He's perfect. <laughs> Are you guys music fans? This is local music. So you guys saw this. This was weird. And this week, the Portland police shut down a local hip-hop show at the Blue Monk for overcrowding. They sent in over a dozen police officers and a gang task force. A gang task force. The Blue Monk is a jazz bar next to a zoo pans. There are more street fights between marching bands in Portland than hip-hop crews. <laughs> Have you guys heard any of the talking buses yet? Yeah, yeah they just, TriMet's starting their second program with the talking buses. Uh, if you, if you have, they put a speaker on the other side of the bus and then it says great phrases like the bus is turning, doors are closing, and if you wanted to get to work on time, you shouldn't have gotten that DUI, asshole. <laughs> Super helpful. Three river rafters you guys were rescued this week from the Clackamas River after their raft hit some rocks and sank. Uh, even though they were found within three hours, they, two out of three of them still agreed that if they had to, they would have eaten Blake first. <laughs> it's Clackamas, you guys. <laughs> what do we do when we run out of Clackamas things to make fun of? I don't even know what we'll do then. Milwaukee. <laughs> Stupid light rail. All right. Uh, a new law in Oregon that uh, passed just recently, you guys, requires schools who want to have Native American mascots to get permission from the tribes first. 
to keep those mascots. That, is it night? Is he saying night? What's that? Some whispering. <laughs> I couldn't tell if you guys agreed or you're, you're frightened of this law. I don't know. <laughs> the tribes like it. They were like, oh, you guys are gonna start asking when you take stuff now? Okay, that's fine. <laughs> Also, uh, in related news, the Chinook tribe is now calling their new softball team the Fighting Decemberists. <laughs> also, an important part of the law now, you guys, uh, all mascots that are not given permission are going to be rounded up and marched out of town, wait for it, on the Trail of Cheers. <laughs> We did a monologue about a story about Florida, so we'll do this one. A Florida plane, in Florida, a plane got caught in the strings of a skydiver's parachute, and both of them crashed. Nobody was injured. Well, no one was seriously injured. Uh, both the pilot and the, the parachutist suffered sore hands from all the awesome high fives they got. <laughs> the Portland Winter, Hawk, Winter Hawks celebrated 100 years of hockey in Portland. Yeah. Yeah, and I celebrated 100 minutes of finding out about our hockey team, so that's exciting. <laughs> we have a hockey team. A uh, Seattle man this week uh, was arrested for selling pot to middle schoolers. He told the cops that he was doing it because the minimum wage is too low. <laughs> it's a good point, you know, those kids are only making minimum wage. They need to get baked. <laughs> I said baked like I say that all the time. Yeah. Isn't that wrong? No, it didn't sound like it. didn't sound that at all? Uh, lastly, you guys, this is my favorite story. Uh, an employee in the Northeast Portland T-Mobile store was unhurt after being robbed at gunpoint. Apparently, you guys, he was protected from bullets by his ironclad two-year contract. <laughs> nothing, nothing gets through that. He tried to punch the robber, apparently, but just like everything else in the T-Mobile store, didn't connect. <laughs> The robber said he has plans to rob a Verizon store as soon as he gets his <laughs> together. So, five year plan. And that's the monologue, you guys! We have such a fun show today. It's good to see you again. I nice see you too. I like to pretend that we only see each other once a month on show days. Yeah. Uh, and that, like a bride and groom, like I don't see you until I come out on stage. <laughs> like, oh, a jean jacket. <laughs> I ran this by you at dress rehearsal, how dare you? You knew about this jean jacket. I know it's casual, but you wear a suit, so I feel like it balances out. I, I said you could wear, I, I said it's fine with me. I'm I didn't say. I'm trying the audience more comfortable because they're all wearing hoodies and you're wearing a suit. You guys like that I'm casual, huh? Panderer. Panderer. Uh, you know, so, we, we're doing, uh, so we're doing a foodie episode here. Yeah. Two, two uh, amazingly accomplished chefs. And uh, because of that, I was starting to think, uh, also we have recently, as you guys can obviously tell, uh, come into a lot of late night action money. And so... That's where I got that suit. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and, and where I got this jean jacket. I could pay more than you. Uh, <laughs> We, anyway, so we're trying to find some places to invest our newfound uh, dollars. And so we've, we've heard that uh, restaurants never fail, right? Yeah. Right? Good. So we're gonna, we decided we're going to invest Especially in... Especially like in Portland. Yeah, yeah. It's great. And so I just all you have to do is come up with a, a name and a great idea, and then you can have a restaurant, right? That's all it takes. So uh, what we did... And like we, a flatbed truck or whatever. We obviously don't know anything. So what we've done is we've brought in some restaurant consultants who have some ideas. They're going to pitch to us, and then we're going to decide where to invest. Does that sound great? Yeah. All right, great. Awesome. Uh, please welcome out Shelly and Michael! <laughs> Uh, so you guys are uh, you guys are like concept designers. Uh, yeah, that looks great. Is this work? Is this is this working? Are it was working. Learning? Okay, great. It's we working a little more. At names, we have a lot of hot ideas for you tonight. I can't wait. Well, so so fire away. Them down. Yeah. Um, we brought some sexy new ideas great. for restaurants, and if you do not act immediately, someone else is going to, and they are going to make all your money. Yes. Like I hope you can handle becoming an aubergiste. That's a fancy word. It means only. It means a restaurateur in French. What is restaurateur in? <laughs> just, let's just let's just, okay, let's sorry, just get sorry, on with this. So sorry. Uh, okay, so the first one we have, listen up. The first one that we have is named Antibiotica. Okay. 
um, there's a lot of negative press around antibiotics and food, and negative press, as we all know, is sexy press. Ah. So this cozy noshery <laughs> advertises the amount of antibiotics included in all dishes, and you eat your food with syringes, and everything uh, is served on shockingly large plates. <laughs> because that is fancy. Okay. All right. Is, is noshery French as well? Yes. Okay, good. Yes. Yep. I like it. So, Mexican food is on trend right now, okay? Uh -huh. So, we've come up with a place called Foiled, where you think you're getting a burrito, but when you open it, it's actually a sword. <laughs> a foil? A foil, sure, sure. So, you've been fooled. You've been fooled. Okay. So, uh, not everyone can afford to eat out frequently, right? No. We're all budget conscious. Like Brie. Like Brie. Yeah. I'm sorry. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so, for the budget conscious, there will be a place called Daddy's Money, where you are paired with a total bitch who talks about herself the whole time and doesn't get off her phone, but she pays for your meal with her dad's credit card. Oh. That's worth it. Uh, we also have sweet spots, so yeah, some desserts. This place is called Depeche a la Mode. All right, so this is desserts only, all right? And where everyone has to try, they have to eat by themselves in a small bedroom covered in Joy Division posters. So. That place the, sounds overrated. It's amazing. It's amazing. It's amazing. Nobody understands it, but it's amazing. Uh, and that's the funniest of the names that we have, right? <laughs> We're just spitballing here. I, it's very, yeah, it seems weird that you're reading spitballing. <laughs> this, this one is going to be super, super big. Lappy Cakes, which is a strip club where the dancers make pancakes while they get off in your business. Full nudity. Full nudity. Full male nudity. Yeah, Portland already has them, but we're trying to turn it into a chain. <laughs> And finally, okay, so this is our last one. Okay. Not everyone likes good service, right? When you go to a restaurant, not everybody no, likes that. I hate so it. what we what's really hot right now, restaurants where the servers ignore you. Okay. And there is always a hummus plate option. Ready for the name? I think I know I where you're I going. Know too, Here's yeah. what we call it. McMinimins. Yeah. <laughs> I think that's the one. Ladies and gentlemen, he's the founder of Ken's Artisan Bakery. But he's also the author of the new book, Flour, Water, Salt, and Yeast. Please welcome to the stage, Ken Forkish! <laughs> this is your book. Right. I'm going to put it right there. Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a big book. Do you, are you worried that people are not going to buy it because the recipe's already on the cover? Do you think? <laughs> yeah. You think that's going to be yeah. a, a detriment? Uh, so tell us about this. So you've been, you've been uh, baking things here for a while, and you've been making pizzas, and you've been uh, trifecting, uh, and, and you have, you have the book. What's the... How do you trifecta? You have done it. You, you're <laughs> doing it. No one uh, it's horses, right? It's something. You're... Yeah. I, I don't know. I'm well, just let's, here, man. So let's start with the book. So tell us, what, uh, yeah. why, did you, why did you want to sit down and write a book? Uh, well, the whole idea about the book was when I started out to become a baker uh, 13, 14 years ago, I just... As I was learning, as I was studying, I just couldn't really find um, the information I wanted. And I learned from a lot of people, and I said, I just wanted to like, consolidate that information, my lessons learned into a book someday. Well, so let's actually, let's take part of that journey with us. So you started, uh, you were your former Silicon Valley guy. 19 years in Silicon Valley. And Didn't you like decided it. that that's not where the money is. The money's in bread. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> so you left the valley, uh, and, 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 you, and you did what? Um, well, basically, I wanted to do something with my hands. I wanted to do my own thing that was, you know, had some... I, I wanted to see the tangible results of my work every day. At, uh, the jobs I had before, you're, you're pitching stuff, you're doing things that... Um, you go home at the end of the day and you're not really sure what you did. You turned around? You, I you apprenticed? Around, you, did yeah. the, you did the thing? You started over in your career at that point. Yeah, no, I, I, I did pretty well and I had enough money to spend a couple years like going to, I just kind of reinvented myself. So I went to five different culinary schools. It was like two weeks here, two weeks there. And just jumped in. 
I heard the craziest story, which is that you wanted to start Ken's Arson Bakery in Eugene, and they didn't like the smell of baking bread. Uh, that is true, yeah. What? Eugene That's smells Eugene. like weed. <laughs> and they're like, no bread. We're not hungry because we don't get weed works. They don't want to get baked? I'm from, from here. I'm from Clackamas. Yeah, that's what I call it. Yeah. So, uh, it was, you know, one of those things that sucked. How did, they, how did they come up to you? How, how did somebody say with a straight face, I don't like the smell of fresh baked bread, uh, well, the greatest did. smell humans have ever found? Uh, they compared it to Sisyphus rolling the same rock up the same hill. Every day. <laughs> oh, it was bad. It was really awful. I'm, I'm glad it happened because I'm so much happier here than ever would have yeah. been. Yeah, yeah, it worked out great. Well, anyway, so I tried to tell the story in there and like a really condensed. It started out like this big, you know, when you're writing your story in your book. Yeah. You start out with your story and then the editors get involved and thankfully it ended up like this big. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, uh, and, and the, but there's also your, your techniques and recipes as well as your stories. Uh, yeah, actually, um, I'm really proud of that book, and I was really proud of winning a Beard Award for it last year, and that just... You, you seem like you do things that you are proud of. You do some uh, incredible things. Uh, like, w would you say you're obsessive? Is that a fair way to describe the way you work on a project? Um, well, yeah. What's wrong with that? No, th nothing. <laughs> that is not... I mean that as a, entirely as a compliment. Uh, I get uh, pretty consumed with stuff, and I just kind of... I, I mean, you know, it's... Give it your all. So you're also giving your all right now to Trifecta. That's your newest your Yeah, newest Trifecta Tavern and Bakery. We opened November 15th. Today is our four-month anniversary. Woo! And what do you, do you, is, that, is that tin? What do, you get, what do you get for four months? There's no metal for it. <laughs> it's, not, it's, it's like Is that paper. the bread anniversary? <laughs> <It's paper>. oh. <laughs> that would be really sweet. It's the bread uh, anniversary would be, it would be really sweet. Uh, now, we opened four months ago. I'm super proud of the place. It's a bar, a restaurant, and a bakery, and that's the Trifecta. Uh, and it's also my third place, so... Depending on my mood, I give a different answer. But right, and, and and you're so you're doing so you're still baking bread there, and you've got a bar, but you're also making savory things. Uh, well, we got a full hotline kitchen, so yeah. we have a wood-fired oven, we have a wood-fired grill, we've got a burner, we got fryers. I mean, we got you know, six cooks in the kitchen every night. It's uh, it's an ambitious restaurant. Yeah, it does seem ambitious. So let me ask you this: you've gotten the, the reviews of Trifecta <laughs> have been like overwhelmingly positive for ninety percent of it. And as a person who's uh, so like perfectionist <laughs> in so many things, when you read that review, do you only see the like the one dish that isn't perfect, or do you notice the ninety percent that's great? No, no, we f***ing hate the reviews because <laughs> <it's>, <laughs> you only see the stuff. You know, like, you know, like the reviewer comes in twice and he says one third of the menu is good for glue paste, and he, he couldn't have had twelve dishes, and so. Uh, you know, it's it's part of the form. It all brings people in, whatever. Right. Uh, but no, we real. I didn't like it. You didn't like it? No, I didn't like it. Yes. Yeah, so it sounds to me like you are then focusing on the small because they you like can't help my it. the overwhelming can't help feeling it. that I got from it is like everybody loved it so yeah. much. Uh, but you can't help but like focus on the bad stuff be, that they write because those are things that you you sweat over. Do you and do you go through like do you ignore them for the first? Do you go through like radio silence with people talking about your restaurant, or do you do you consume everything as like feedback that you're working? Oh, through? I try to. I really don't read much of it. Oh, good. To be honest. Uh, the only feedback I had back and forth was uh, our first review from the Oregonian, Oregonian was if you read the print, it was a great review, but they instituted the star system with uh, my restaurant, and so instead of getting a letter grade, which probably would have been pretty good, we got two stars and then two empty stars. And two stars <laughs> by themselves would have been fine. The two empty stars kind of suck. So right. and, I you, and you focus this, on the empty stars. Well, and yeah, not the full ones. you know. So I'm in bed in the morning reading my review, and I, I started with the stars, and then I was kind of had frowning face for the rest of the read. <laughs> oh, it, so it's all good, man. You know, yeah, we yeah. are. We're, we're busy. We're doing good. I'm really super proud of the place. Uh, we're delivering a great experience for the people, for the most part. So you said this thing in an email to me. I asked you if you would bring in some bread that we could give away in the show, which you kindly did. And we have some, we have some loaves of fresh today bread that you guys are going to have a chance to win, as well as we're going to give away a copy of the book a little later in the show. But you said this great thing when I asked about the bread, which is you said you're making the best bread of your career right now. I this am. is the, yeah, the best very bread proud of your of it. career. Very proud which of it. is the perfect way to say that. For somebody, like it just, it just seems like it encapsulated a lot of the way you go about a project. That you well, have... my soul goes into it. My, my heart and my mind yeah. uh, goes into it completely. That sounds exhausting. Have you ever tried coasting? <laughs> <laughs> have you, I mean, it seems like... It's, like, it's in the plans. It is. <laughs> I think you deserve the it. The bakery and the pizza place is just so good. It, it's you like could have been like, oh, I'm just going to let my bread be perfect for the rest of my life. If you're an artist, you want to build a body of work, right? Yeah. Uh, in your career, you want to build a body of work. I mean, any, in any career, when you're 
develop when you're producing things, I think you should give the best of yourself. And so you get to a point where, you know, maybe at some point, but I started this career when I was 43 years old, so uh, it takes a while before I want to coast. I'm not done yet. Before you just open a, like start managing an Einstein bagels. <laughs> If you, I hate bagels. You hate bagels? I do. I mean, I respect the bagels. They just, don't, you know, it's just not your thing. Yeah. Uh, and if you made it, you'd make it better than anybody else. Uh, but you're not gonna be. Not. No, it's just not my thing. You gotta love it to make it well. Right. Yeah, like a loaf of bread, like that bread. It's like. What kind of bread is that? Uh, that is field blend number three. Is the name? It's different blends of flowers, and I got a couple recipes in my book: field blend number one and number two. Uh -huh. And this was uh, another one. It's rye flour, whole wheat flour, and white wheat flour. And it's uh, naturally leavened, and it's, uh, I love it. And it's a little, it's a little darker than some people might be used to with their breads. Uh, it's uh, how I like it. <laughs> I'm making bread that I like, and I hope that people like it. And I don't mean what I just said, that's but it's true. like kind of like, you know, I'm not trying to be McDonald's. I'm not trying to go for like this thing that's going to satisfy the broadest spectrum. I want to do something for my heart and hope people enjoy it. Absolutely. And for the, the, what? Yeah, you, you said did. Off. You did. Yeah. Uh, and that's the right thing to say. I think that's the right way to be. And fortunately, uh, unlike Eugene, this town gets it. We're, yeah, we we're on board with your yeah. right. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah, we can say yeah. that. Yeah, yeah. 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 Uh, it's fake TV, not real TV. Yeah. <laughs> all righty. Um, I might have to deal with this later. <laughs> I think it'll be all right. Uh, and we're, and we're going we're gonna to give these away. We're going to have a set change giveaway in a little bit. Uh, but uh, go check out Trifecta. Eat 90% of the menu. Enjoy the ambiance and the drinks. Uh, <laughs> And enjoy the best bread of Ken's life. Ladies and gentlemen, Ken Forkus! You guys ready for your, uh, for your com comedian? For your com comedy comedian? Uh, you guys are lucky. He is recent, a recent convert to Portland, and he's absolutely taken over, and he's, uh, all, he's been playing across the festival circuit right now, including he'll be at Bridgetown uh, in, a, in a few short months. Uh, please welcome Mr. Curtis Cook! <laughs> Oh, what's up, everybody? <laughs> this is awesome. I, uh, I did just recently move to Portland. I'm from Cleveland originally, and as soon as I got here, I got a job at a Fred Meyers. I worked in the garden house section, which just means I dealt with different women coming in all day asking questions about plants. The other day, this woman came in with a small pot like you would keep in your bathroom for decoration. She was like, excuse me, sir, I'd like to buy some dirt for this pot. I was like, where we got big bags of dirt now? And she's like, no, I didn't know a lot of dirt. I seen a little bit of top this pot off. I was like, oh, well, I'm not supposed to tell you this but have you checked outside? Uh, and then I got fired from Fred Myers. <laughs> Sucks. Uh, I don't know what's going on right now. <laughs> the other day I was in a bar uh, and I was just hanging out in the shadows judging people in superfluous fedoras and unironically listening to the Indigo Girls in a jukebox. And from the other side of the bar I heard this blonde white girl go, tonight I really want to have sex with a black guy, uh, which is crazy because she wasn't even fat. <laughs> So I sprinted over here to meet the other two black guys that were sprinting towards her, and I, which is as many black people are allowed in one place at any given time in Portland, Oregon. And I got there first, and I was like, what's up? She's like, I met a real black guy, you Puerto Rican looking It's like, God, now I'm never going to get to have sex with a racist. So then I just got drunk because that's how I handle rejection and also all of my feelings. And then because I was drunk, I had to go to the bathroom, so I went to the bathroom, and a little piece of graffiti was on the wall right in front of my face, and the graffiti read, in spite of everything, I still believe that there is good in people, quoth Anne Frank. Uh, so right underneath that I wrote, kids say the darndest things, <laughs> quoth Bill Cosby. <laughs> then I went back out to the bar, and this other white girl started flirting with me, she, but she could tell it was uncomfortable, so she was like, don't worry, I'm not white, I'm actually 1 16th Native American. <laughs> And I never know what to do when white people say that because when white people say they're 1 16th Native American, it sounds like they're bragging about a rape that happened a really long time ago. <laughs> yeah, I wasn't sure if that joke would be okay to tell. I wanted to ask a Native American to be sure, but I couldn't find any because white people are so good at murder. <laughs> uh, so I did the next best thing and I went to a dollar store and I bought a little plastic bag of Native American figurines. I took them all home to my kitchen. I put them in the kitchen cupboard. I closed the door. I opened it up. They all came to life. <laughs> I was like, hey guys, is that joke okay? They're like, yeah, we're good. I was like, word, then I closed the door. <laughs> that joke is only my favorite when other people have read that book. <laughs> so thanks people who were in middle school when I was also in middle school. <laughs> 
I did just recently buy that book so I could read it again, and I bought it at Powell's, which was weird, because the first thing I saw when I got into Powell's was that they had an African-American section, and that didn't make any sense to me, because no African-American has ever written a book. They couldn't go into literally any other section of the bookstore. So I thought they were telling me I wasn't allowed in any other section of the bookstore. So I just stayed there. <laughs> and I picked up a book called Introduction to the Black Experience, which is weird because it makes it sound like there's only one. Like if you took my life and Tupac's life and Colin Powell's life and made a Venn diagram, everything would go in the middle. <laughs> but it just ended up being a collection of slave narratives, and I can't read about slavery in public because as a black person, when you read about slavery, it makes you feel for your culture and your ancestry and your heritage and what was done to it. Uh, but as an individual, I'm really into BDSM. <laughs> So reading slave narratives is an emotional roller coaster. <laughs> it's like Master Miss working the hot filth with no pay. I'm like that's strong. It's like Master strip me and whip me as my bosom song, and I'm like that is, ugh. <laughs> so I bought that book. I've been <laughs> the life of Frederick Gull Douglass for the last five days. <laughs> I told that joke once at a show in Ohio and afterwards this elderly white couple came up to me. They were like, thank you for finally pointing out how sexy slavery can be. I was like, oh no. What did I do? Uh, the other day I was in a grocery store. I was going to buy some soap and I noticed that one side of the aisle was this beautiful sherbet colored hue of deliciousness with flavors like uh, pomegranate paradise and strawberry bliss and kiwi forever but all those flavors were for women which sucked because the other side of the aisle was for men and it was just a bunch of black and blue bottles and they were all named after either ice or a mountain and I wanted to buy the women's soap but I'm afraid that one day I'm going to wake up to have some strange gender based amnesia where I can't remember who I am unless everything I own has the word mandarin somewhere on it we would take a shower it's like who am I? oh man I smell like cold rocks it's going to be a good day so I was trying to find an excuse to buy the woman's bottle, so I price compared, and both the bottles are the same price, which is weird because one of those groups makes significantly less money. And then I flipped, <laughs> then I flipped it over to the back to read the description, and the back of the woman's bottle was like, hey girl, after a long year at the office and being who they want you to be, don't you deserve to come hold and exfoliate in a bath of all natural herbal essences because you're worth it? And I was like, yeah, girl. <laughs> and then I read the back of the men's bottle and it was like, hey, you know what goes good with and beard? This lotion. <laughs> Well, that's disgusting. <laughs> Beer and lotion, three excellent things separately together. Somebody's getting a UTI and cranberry juice is expensive. <laughs> and I wish, if they were gonna try to market a product to me based on the kind of person I was supposed to be, they would take it one step further, so it'd be like head and shoulders. For men who do the crippling fears of success and abandonment issues, shout their opinions at strangers in the form of jokes somewhere on a Saturday night, two-in-one shampoo and conditioner. <laughs> Cocoa butter for colored girls who've considered suicide when the rainbow ain't enough, it's fine. <laughs> Should have saved that for a different city entirely. <laughs> I feel bad sometimes when I talk about things that have to do with sex and women because I don't know what that experience is and I get worried about how my jokes represent how I feel about women and equality and all those things and I don't understand it and I realize that recently I do have a certain degree of male privilege that I have to live with every day because I don't, and this isn't to take away from the fear and discomfort other people have to have in their lives, but I got cat called yesterday and it was the nicest thing that's ever happened to me. <laughs> Some guy just rolled out his window and was like, Hey, you got a nice I was like, that is the sweetest thing to say right now. <laughs> and I feel bad because I don't mean to take away from the pressure and the pain that other people have to feel when they go through those things, but I feel like what we as men need to do for society is co-opt cat calling and only do it to each other. <laughs> but think how beautiful a world it would be if every day I went outside, some guy was like, Hey, you got a nice I'd be like, Hey, thank you. They'd be like, You want a I'd be like, Nah, but I appreciate the sentiment. They'd be like, smile. I'd be like, you're right, things aren't so bad. So <laughs> I'll see you guys later. Hey, Curtis, thanks for being here. Thanks for having me. Sorry our couch is not big enough for you. It's okay. <laughs> <laughs> Just relax a little yeah, bit. Yeah, relax a little bit. This is an adult-sized couch. I mean, it's not like... I mean, it's not a couch, but anyway. Uh, <laughs> do you, how, how, so you've been here how long now? It was a year in January. A year in January. So how how is how's Portland treated you so far? It's okay. Yeah? It's better than Cleveland. <laughs> I mean, I, all I, I've heard the Cleveland rocks, but I've never been. <laughs> you should go. Okay. Check it out. It's like Portland, but with less jobs somehow. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's an impressive trick. How, how has uh, how has the Portland crowd uh, treated you differently? Like it seems like you say a lot of things that might be at our expense, and yet uh, the, the audiences still enjoy that the way you can make them feel uncomfortable. The nice thing about Portland crowds is that they have read before, and so, <laughs> oh, and 
so I can make so many jokes I couldn't make in Cleveland. <laughs> well, and you're, I mean, you're, you're, you went to Oberlin, so have you, like, even like right now, are you uncomfortable with such pedestrian intellects as, as ours? Uh, well, oh, no, you're very smart. <laughs> you're a very handsome man, very well read. Your wife is lucky. <laughs> you also? I don't have a wife and you know it. <laughs> So, so Curtis, you're also, you've also been, like I said, you've been on the, the festival circuit uh, like crazy. Uh, Cincinnati, Salt Lake, Seattle, Br Bridgetown. Did you do Sketchfest this year? You did Sketchfest yeah. this year? Uh, in how San Francisco. You, yeah, in San Francisco? And we should make it clear that this is, these are comedy festivals. You're not just like following Dave Matthews or anything. <laughs> yeah. I guess we do need to make that clear when we talk to a comedian. Shut up, Alex. <laughs> just trying to color the interview. Racist. How dare you? <laughs> so people know that that's yeah, okay. We're, we're, we're all okay. Uh, how do you like that? How do you like the, the festivals versus like, uh, you know, uh, the bars and clubs around Portland? What do you, how is that as an atmosphere for comedy? I like it a lot. Um, I like doing the festivals a lot and then I don't like talking to anybody afterwards. <laughs> this is fine though, but normally... Good. <laughs> this is okay. <laughs> so tell me this uh, really quick before we go. Uh, you got a podcast as well. Yeah, yeah, uh, I got a podcast. <laughs> Why? Why is that so funny? I keep forgetting I have a podcast. All right. Well, so th I'll give you. A, uh, this is a freebie here. Here's a softball. This is the time you plug your podcast. <laughs> they don't want it. They're not going. No, that's what they're you're here for. My podcast is called Black by Popular Demand. We talk about. <laughs> oh, on. We talk keep going. about. Uh, we talk about the differences that occur within shade when you look at the black diaspora in the United States and how it affects and shapes different people's experiences. You know, those things you have to tell people you care about. <laughs> that tagline is on every, he has to say it every time. It's on the flyers. We should have you. I, you've, had, you've talked to people of color before once or twice. I, uh, you've been doing all the diaspora. <laughs> Diaspora? Uh, no, diaspora. no, listen, Oberlin, I'll be fine. <laughs> I'll look it up on my phone later. <laughs> It'll be fine. I would do I, a show. I know what diaspora means. <laughs> I sounds, went to public school. It sounds like a, dun <laughs> sounds like a Dungeons and Dragons move. Is that what that's about? <laughs> I got a level four diaspora. I'm going to go into the cave. No? Tap your mana. All right. Uh, so where do we find that? Where do people find that? Uh... Um, follow me on Twitter at, <laughs> at, at Curtis underscore Cook, and then I'll just tell you if you want to know. <laughs> Curtis underscore Cook! Uh, we are very lucky. You, you met them a little bit earlier, but they're going to come back. Uh, the Aces here with us, and they are one of the best sketch comedy groups in the city, and we are lucky to have them. So please welcome out the Aces! Springtime is here, Sabine. I declare this day to be glorious, like a thousand children's faces. Gretchen, I am dizzy with bluebells and daffodils coasted by the sky, with clouds too plentiful to count to spring. Sabine, I find that distant footpath beckoning my heart to follow it between fallopial hedgerows and pubescent dales. How I love spring! Gretchen, let's follow the procreation call. Through the willows, betwixt the watery, craggy, watery sides, until our feet are entangled and our hair once again clean. How I do love spring. Sabine, look over that valley of silly evergreens. Yes. Aware of the non erectionists, but too proud to do anything about it. <laughs> Imagine what they must say to the morning dew. Spring feels like hands holding their own hands. Why? <laughs> I imagine they're saying, good morning, you busybodies, <laughs> lubricating your forest fellows with sensuality. <laughs> Let's you and I stray to them and undress between their, their willows. You and I, springtime, it is a feast for which I am a guest. I'd like to be invited. Oh, you're welcome. Thank you. <laughs> what does that sound, Gretchen? What? That is the sound of the bush tit. Yes. Springtime it into my face. That bush tit must be wooing the brown booby. <laughs> Imagine the pair they must make. Springtime is sounding its deafening horn. Gretchen, this good morning, I do declare <laughs> that a thousand dandelions parachuted around my head and awoke me from my drunkenness for last night. 
I did binge. Springtime makes me want to touch. <laughs> Sabine, last night while you binged on drink, I also over consumed no. on a million stars oh. in a crystal sky through the blackest of nights over a shadowy meadow in conjunction with the waning moon as it's heretofore what we have come to expect from the season. <laughs> Springtime is my boyfriend! <laughs> Roger, do you see that church steeple over there? That looks like a grown man's boner! Where? Over there! Springtime rules! Sabine, let's you and I hurry down to the village square where we will just rope to our sheerest of undergarments. Yes. And then we will spray each other with the coldest of waters. Oh, and then we will wrap through village streets through the chilliest of springtime breezes. Three, straight into council chambers we will declare to the bankers and the lawyers and the entrepreneurs that our springtime lights are indeed on and they are bright. <laughs> <laughs> to spring! <laughs> guest is the chef and owner of Beast Restaurant. She's also been on Top Chef Masters and on Iron Chef. Please welcome Naomi Pomeroy! Thank you so much for being here. Uh, this is so awesome. I, this has been it's so fun to talk about food. This is a, a, a big, I'm a big fan. Uh, every day. Every day, I eat food. And, um, but it's, one thing that's interesting is that you are obviously uh, you didn't get into cooking because you wanted to be famous. I'm assuming, uh, but now you were forced by our yellow couch and these hot lights of springtime to be famous. Uh, how do you how do you feel about the, about chefing and being on talk shows? How does how is that like work life balance going? I like it. I like it. Um, I, you know, it's fun to talk about. You know, when you do what you love for work, it's. It's fun. It's fun to go to work. It's fun to talk about it and share it with everyone else. So I can't complain. And this couch is really soft. It's so. not bad. Uh, and it looks like a giant seashell. So you guys are like, it looks like the beginning of a little mermaid. Yeah, we are. We are going to be yeah, our father Zeus. Zeus gave us <laughs> to the world. The next, uh, so how do you like cooking on television? How's that been for you? Uh, you know what? Like, cooking on television is not as much fun as cooking in real life. Why is that? Believe it or not. Um, it's pretty stressful, you know, and it's not real either. So, really? Yeah, no, I mean, you know... It's all plastic food. That's all the thing plastic, I'm you. And, yeah. Well, the, it doesn't actually go anywhere. Like, no one really eats it. That's the sad mm -hmm. thing, you know I mean? That is so sad! Yeah, I mean, if you make it... Well, I mean, you know, not that many people are signing up to eat deep-fried night crawlers or, you know, marshmallows no. paired with corned beef or whatever. I always thought that the, show, the crew would probably just... Yeah, I just they might. might. They might be I assume they were with Interns that got to come yeah. and come rough no, You know what's funny is a lot of times people actually they weren't allowed. So it, uh, I, some of the people that worked on the show, especially on, on Top Chef Masters, you know, they'd say, wow, that food looked really good today, but we're not allowed to have any because we can't like be biased. Even even with, you know, even if all, their only job is to like get you your chef coat every day, they can't they can't taste anything because they're not allowed to like you know, get you your chef coat faster because your food is better than the other guy or whatever. It's weird. I don't know. It's it's very, they try weird. to keep it very equal and very serious, but it's not it's not real cooking when you're just trying to make something in seven minutes or whatever. Yeah. Do you have like do you have stress dreams like that where you like wake up and you're like, I have four more minutes to make some oh my God. spatula yeah. of food. Some of the other contestants and I, you know, we became friends and, and, and we would talk, you know, as after we were finally done with that hell. Um, we would talk a little bit about uh, it was like we were having um, post-traumatic stress disorder. Actually, like significantly, I think none of us um, had a dream other than a Top Chef Master dream for for at least thirty days after the show had ended. And it was like every night, you know, just sweating and like I'm gonna die. Yeah. Oh, God. Yeah, it's terrible. It's, it still happens sometimes. You sure. I mean, it's amazing that everybody is so pleasant on those shows now. I had no idea it was that difficult, like that stressful. Or, I, mean, I don't know if I was known for being a pleasant one, but <laughs> yeah, maybe not. But anyway, I mean, well, was, uh, so are you saying, glad I did it. Are you okay. saying you were not there to make friends? Yeah, not there to make friends. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, you know, you, I, I want to talk to you about your, your real food uh, oh, okay. as much as, as I do that. But I'm a huge fan of Top Chef, so that's interesting to hear you say. I you, talk for hours about it. Cooked the out of that show. I had a really, I mean, so, you know, on the one hand, while it sucked really badly and it was incredibly stressful, on the other hand, um, 
you know, it was, it became fun, kind of, I mean, in a way, it's just that the adrenaline rush, I kept wondering, like, what it was doing to my internal organs and how many years I was yeah. cutting off of my life every time I went on the show, because it's like, you're not, you're not supposed to have that kind of, like, vibe every day, I'm sorry, I'm so poor like, <laughs> look, we're supposed to be chilling out. It's a weird vibe. Yeah, stressful. Uh, well, they moved here, they know what Yeah, they know. <laughs> Uh, you all, I mean, uh, you, you also made things harder on yourself. I mean, you led the Restaurant Wars team, uh, and you made a dessert, and you were front of the house. The did, three kids of that. Did you guys talk? Is he, the, he no. might be the only fan here. What if, I, what if they have no idea what you're talking about? You don't know. You don't, you don't know what I'm talking about? No, I do, but maybe they don't. I do remember that. Yes, I do. In fact, so I the just three hardest work. things on the show, and you did them all in the same episode on episode one. Wait, yes, wait. But the thing that happened the first episode that I think you might not, you don't remember this part, which was that I was like the only one of 12, I think, that didn't come to the plate on the first quick fire challenge. So if you guys don't know, the synopsis is, you know, you have uh, 15 minutes to do something and something, silly. something ridiculous like cook, you know, anchovies and dragon fruit together, I think, which was mine, or sardines or something like that. I mean, a combination that's unworldly and no one would want to eat. And you have 15 minutes to do it. And I thought that I had it in the bag. Like, I was like, okay. Because I, you know, before I went on the show, I went to the fishmonger. And I was like, teach me how to, like, fillet. I don't cook fish at Beast. Like, Beast is called Beast, and we don't really cook yeah. fish there. So it's not I did. aqua Beast. That would be the thing. No, no. I mean, some fish are really kind of scary looking. Monkfish in particular. But, yeah. um. Opa? Is yeah. Just Ooh. Crazy. Parrot fish. What? That's not a real fish. That's a that was on Chop the other day, and they had taken apart and it looked like a stuffed animal. It was heartbreaking. <laughs> That's good. It looked like a muppet. It looked like something like a muppet. You have to pair dragon fruit and gonzo. You have six minutes. <laughs> They made us drink a lot before the beef. You know, really? oh, yeah, and, and not sleep much. A lot of alcohol. They trick you. And there was one person who shall remain nameless that brought some other things in addition to alcohol that were relaxing medications. I have a guess, and I want you to tell me so bad. <laughs> okay, I'll tell you later. But, anyway, uh, but, but I'm just saying, like, just to finish that quick story, yeah, which yeah. is that I didn't make it to the plane on my first quick fire challenge. I, I didn't come, I mean, I had my food, like, ready to go, but it didn't make it onto the plate, and I was um, forever shamed, and, and, and well, one of the... the only one who didn't get on the plate on that first challenge. But, there, was a, there was one person who didn't get anything, and another person who forgot her sauce. Oh. You don't remember the same? I do. Yeah. How many times did you I see like these things? I never watched your season oh. when you were coming on. Okay. Uh, so I just, I just watched That's it. That's such a... I haven't even seen all the episodes. So anyway, I, I, but I ended up getting some counseling from an older chef friend who was like, hey, girl, you can do this. And so I just took it to heart, and I think that after that, I said, you know. You did so, this is the same Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. 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 See, I'm doing it, I'm doing this for you, Ken. Bagels, the show. <laughs> no, I promised no, Ken he, that I would swear more than him so that he was Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but you did. So I said it three times. Uh, so talk to, talk to me about this, uh, about your the way you've come up in, in the cooking world here. Oh, yeah. Specifically, if possible, I would love to hear about your underground supper club oh, sure, days. Because yeah. that sounds amazing. <laughs> you know, about 15 years ago, I started a little catering company called Ripe. And uh, we we just, there weren't really a lot of catering companies here. So, and I don't know, I, I went to Lewis and Clark College and I have a degree in history. And Woo! I, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that mascot. Yeah, I don't know. Bio. I don't even know. Bio. 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 Uh, so I, uh, you know, I ended up not really knowing what I was going to do and I, I just kind of, I love to cook. I grew up cooking with my family. I, I cooked like, not really professionally. I mean, I had worked for some good, you know, chefs and done some other catering operations. And I just decided to start a catering company out of my basement. Um, yeah, that, so that, was back, that was back when, in the day when, yeah. you know, I mean, I don't know, that was crazy. We, we did it, some catering, like, for the mayor's office and stuff like that, even though we had a completely, like, illegitimate <laughs> scheme out of our basement that was, like, rat-infested northwest, <laughs> or, or east Portland. <laughs> what's, what's the statute of limitations on illegal commissary? Well, look, I'm all, I'm all, I'll, I'll above the board now, but, yeah. but you know, <laughs> that was really fun, but we really were doing things, like, we really did defrost trim in our bathtub, like, that was, that was, that was, that was, that was That's a classic party. Yeah, that was fun. 
Um, so basically, we did that, and then um, we started doing these underground dinners um, right after our daughter was born. So she's 13 now. So 13 years ago, we were doing some underground. So what's dinners. an underground dinner like? And this is also not above board. This is not. No, not above board. No. So, so this is it's like a secret knock on board. the back door, yeah. and then there's just a professional restaurant style, but in a person's house. Yep, I think it still goes on all the time. I mean, I have, I actually have employees that work for me now that do it too. And how? Yeah, on the whole table. <laughs> how, how famous do you have to be to get invited to one? I'll go with you. We can go together. I would like to see how my cook is doing in his, uh, you know, when, when he's not at work. In his, in his uh, moonlighting? Yeah. Well, actually, I don't know if you would love eating with me. Um, Why? This is the next part. This is the next thing we're going to do. <laughs> okay. So, do I have to cook something? No, but yeah. I can't. You have six bread. minutes. <laughs> with a loaf of bread and an owl candle. Go. <laughs> Candle toast. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, I, I want to talk to you about uh, like the stuff that you're doing at Beast, uh, but I am a vegetarian and uh, Brie is not, and so Brie. Talk about all of the meat. Uh, not everything at Beast is super meat heavy. While well, we do have meat on the menu, if you're a strict vegetarian, you're going to have a tough time. Except for once a month or so, we do a totally vegetarian menu. Why no. haven't you? That. Do you know how much it costs? <laughs> It's just I put all of my money into these bad restaurant concepts. Oh, really? <laughs> really, they don't pay you super well to just go? Like, you should sell it to, like, you know... To Einstein's Bagels. <laughs> to Einstein's Bagels. <laughs> I heard they're doing really well. Yeah, I mean, your, your vegetarian menus look amazing. But talk about, like, the thing that you're... Like, what's the, the, the heart of your restaurant piece? Like, what's the... the talk to Brie about meat. I don't know what... Hi. Hi. Okay, now Brie and I are going to talk about meat. Um, does anyone else want to talk about meat? Woo! Yeah. Uh, yeah, except for you. No. Sorry. Close your ear <laughs> um, No, it's, it's actually, um, you know, what we do at Beast is we have six courses, and it's a, a fixed menu, set menu with no choices. Um, and so that's why well, you it's not said that, like, like, that is also part of the heart of the restaurant. Like, you don't, no choices. Yeah. Just don't with what we're doing. That's what I'm saying. I love it. We know what's and you gotta just deal with it. No, I mean, I think one thing that I really enjoy is, is knowing, you know, that I'm good at what I do and you're good at what you do. I'm not gonna try to host a talk show and, you know, I, I you know, I, I don't know. I don't know. I just feel like yeah. I, I want to trust what other people are up to, you know, when they're professionals and what they do. If I go to, you know, see a band, I'm not going to try and get on stage. So, you know, please, if you come to the restaurant, just know that we know what's happening and what's good right now and what's in season at the farmer's yeah. market. We're going to treat you right. We really will. I yeah. promise. So, so that's what we do is we just do what we do and we hope that people are into it. But like what Ken said about how he serves like burnt bread to everyone or whatever. <laughs> And some people say, like, oh, it's too dark. Yeah. Great. Don't buy the bread. You know yeah. what I mean? Because that's the way that it, we like it. Because And we're cooks. Um, and, and I think it's perfect. And I'm glad that he takes it, like, one one degree darker. And everyone should just learn to like it. So, But just because people are used to eating it incorrectly doesn't mean <laughs> that they should. You guys are half artists and half, like, craftsmen. Like, you do the thing every day, but also it's, like, a taste that's your career-long thing that you develop. Yeah, and, yeah. and in your case, it's pig head. Well, we do. Yeah, we cook some pig heads. <laughs> That's true. Um, and, and it's not as scary as it sounds, because if you really think about it, like, like for an argument for eating the head of a pig is that we eat the leg of a pig and the, you know, belly of a pig, so yeah. why are we being weird about eating other parts? Because really, it's like, if we have a problem with that, then we should all side with Alex and we should just not eat any meat. I, Which I actually don't have a problem with either. You, to be frank, I was a vegetarian. You a former vegetarian, years. and you not only fell off the bandwagon, you <laughs> fell off the bandwagon <laughs> so hard, you opened a rival bandwagon. <laughs> It's true, but you know what? I, I, to be, to be totally honest, um, you know, in support of the idea of, of vegetarianism, I actually don't eat a lot of meat when I'm not at work. I mean, honestly, I, I, I eat mostly vegetables, and and the focus of what we actually do at Beast, which I think I'd like to, to take this uh, opportunity with this enormous audience here to just spell a myth that is that 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 it Beast is super meat heavy. Like you're going to come in and eat like a Flintstones sized steak. 
cake and we're going to make you have like a meat dessert at the end or something like that. We don't do that. Oh, it's really don't vegetable heavy. Like like yeah. literally 70% of the menu is vegetables. So just come in and be surprised. Uh, on, on top of you, there's a lot of amazing desserts. Oh, so your, that your, was scary. Your, your pastry uh, abilities are also incredible. I sure. actually have no pastry ability whatsoever, but you, that's the magic of television. <laughs> <laughs> So we're almost out of time, but tell me about it. Yeah, so we, uh, my husband, Kyle, is uh, a cocktail magician. Um, I like actually, that so much better than mixologist. Okay, when, when, someone, <laughs> when someone calls Kyle a mixologist, he says that he's a scientist. He comes back with being, he says, like, yes, I am a Scientologist. I don't know why. <laughs> But he doesn't like that term, so um, I don't know. I just called him cocktail magician. I don't know if he likes that one any better because that like implies rabbits and hats and whatever. Uh, but but the cocktails are pretty good. It's I the focus. Like the rabbit part, but the hat sounds great. Yeah, don't eat the rabbit. Um, it's the focus of uh, of the place. It's right across the street from Beast, um, and and it's a, a fun list of cocktails from foreign lands. Um, and we do um, heavy influence of sort of uh, slightly Asian-inspired drinking snacks, and things are generally very spicy, um, salty, fried, and hope, hope, hopefully awesome. That's it. Uh, every, everything that I've read about said they're awesome. Especially oh, yeah. Salty, fried, and awesome. Yeah. Salty, fried, and awesome. That's the other name. Is, uh, salty, fried, and awesome. Okay. Uh, the recipe's on the cover. Two years. Give me two years. Yeah. <laughs> salty, <laughs> fried, and awesome. Uh, so check out Expatriate Across Week and from Beast. Ladies and gentlemen, Naomi Pop! Welcome, Amon, Chris Hubbard, and the Bonus Show Trio! This is a Cole Porter song. My story is much too sad to be told But practically everything leaves me totally cold The only exception I know is the case When I'm out quiet spring fighting vainly the old on we and I suddenly turn to see your fabulous face I get no kick from champagne mere alcohol doesn't thrill me at all so tell me why should it be true that I get a kick out of you? Some get their kick from cocaine. I know that if I took even one sniff, it would bore me terrifically too. But I get a kick out of you. I get a kick every time I see you standing there before me. I get a kick, though it's clear to see you obviously don't adore me. Some get their kicks on a plane, flying so high with some guy in the sky. You know, I chose to sing this song tonight, not just because you all are huge Cole, Cole Porter fans, uh, and this is your favorite song, and it sounds really great at my instrument, uh, but because I know some really interesting things about this song that I wanted to share with you all. Uh, and I thought I'd do it right now. Uh, Cole Porter was a, a, a magician with words, um, a wordologist, they say, and um, he had tons of lyrics for all of his songs, uh, lyrics that didn't make the final cut, so to speak. Um, and there are a couple pretty famous examples of lost lyrics for this song. I gotta get out of you. Uh, the most famous of which is the last verse. If you remember, not 30 seconds ago, I sang a verse about plane flight. Um, that's not the original last verse. The original last verse was still about plane flight, but it went a little differently. Uh, and it went like this. Some get a kick on a plane. I shouldn't care. For those nights in the air that the fair Mrs. Lindbergh goes through. 
But I get a kick out of you. I think it's a better verse. Um, it's as clever and it's a little more specific, a little more topical. Um, the problem with the verse was that shortly after he wrote it, the Lindbergh baby was kidnapped. It's a true story. Um, so he decided to change it to be less confrontational. You know, didn't want to offend anyone in the 30s. Uh, if you remember the second verse, it was about cocaine. Um, and when they made the movie of Anything Goes, which is the musical that this song appears in, um, the MPAA at the time didn't think it was okay to mention cocaine in a Hollywood picture. So Cole Porter very gracefully changed it to um, some like the perfume in Spain so that he could keep the, the line about uh, taking a sniff. Very clever, but again, not quite as good. So those are the two famous uh, examples of lost lyrics, but I did some digging and found two other really interesting uh, sets of lost lyrics to this song that I thought I would share for you. Uh, the first is actually the very first verse that Cole Porter ever wrote for this song. Uh, he wrote it in 1915, in fact. Uh, this song originated as a jingle. It was a jingle for a brand new ocean liner that had just been uh, released on the market. It was really hip and really cool. And uh, they hired Cole Porter to write this jingle for it. It was called the RMS Lusitania. And it went like this. Some dig the new Lusitania. Not just a ship, but a hip way to trip and to slip past the German U crew. But I get a kick out of you. That guy right there, he remembers his 12th grade history. <laughs> um, yeah, the RMS Lusitania it didn't do so well for very long. Um, so that's that verse. And uh, the last verse I wanted to share with you actually wasn't written by Cole Porter. Um, in the 80s, his granddaughter, uh, Natalie Cole Porter, uh, she put out a tribute album uh, of all his tunes, and of course you have to include this song, it's like his best song. Um, but she wanted to update it a little bit, you know, for the 80s. Uh, and so she changed the last verse, which was about plane flight, you remember that last verse? Uh, she changed it to be about space flight. Um, the only problem with that was that about a month before the CD was going to come out, I guess they didn't have CDs back then. Did they have CDs in 1986? I don't know why I look at you as if you would know that. <laughs> uh, about a month before the, the, the record came out, uh, the Challenger blew up. I don't know if you ever remember that. but uh, So the, the record company pulled the album. And so none of you have ever heard this, uh, this verse, which I think is a really nice verse. Some get their kicks on the moon Landing a birth On a flight far from Earth Isn't worth all the hullabaloo Cause I get a kick out of you Chris Hubbard and the Bonus Joe Trio a good challenger joke, everybody always enjoys that. A good challenger reference. Uh, it's been long enough, right? I think it has. With the Lusitania, it might have been too long. Too long? Is that a thing, too long? <laughs> it is, yeah. We don't say it as often as we should. Uh, uh, <laughs> so, Chris, uh, so tell us about the, why are you the bonus show trio. Tell us about the bonus show. So the bonus show is a variety show that I started uh, back in September. It's a monthly variety show. And don't worry, it doesn't compete with you guys. It sounds like it does. Well, you, but you guys are the third Saturday. That's true. And we're the first Tuesday. That's, okay. It's different real estate there. Totally, totally different, different day of the week. It's, pretty, it's like two and a half weeks apart. And no, so also your show is a musical variety show from yeah. beginning to end. No, so no steps. Our show, <laughs> not yet. Although I'm looking to branch out. I mean... We had our first comedian on last month. Yeah, I heard that it one. Went, okay, it went all right. Uh -huh. It was okay. Uh, he it took over you. the show for. It was me. It went fine. Uh, yeah, you know, so it's 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 musical based. We have uh, it's me on on piano, and then our fine gentleman uh, Fletcher on the bass. And tonight we have Ben filling in on the drums. But we have Fletcher and Ben, you guys. Uh, we have bass and drums, so it's so it's sort of built around a couple of sets of, of interesting and, and pretty and fun songs to play, and then we. Pepper in some some games, some interesting guests. So we have we have comedian on, we have different musicians on, and uh, um, all sorts of different things that you can expect. I, I think 
my, I just thought of the way to describe Chris's show because I just saw it. Um, he is the Charlie Rose of rock and roll. <laughs> <laughs> you will enjoy this. I will take it. It's really good. Uh, it's really fun. Uh, you want to play one more song for us? Yeah, we'd love to do one more. Uh, the, 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 I guess you can't use probably one of the older tunes we do. This is like probably the newest tune we do. That's one. Well, uh, I'd love to hear it. Ladies and gentlemen, come on, Chris Hubbard! <laughs>